Good morning. Please can I extend a very warm welcome to the panel and to the audience in what is another lovely morning here in Edinburgh. This is the first event to kick off the Festival of Politics, which will run from today until Saturday. My name is Colette Stevenson and I am the MSP for East Kilbride and currently a member of the Cross Party Group on End of Life Choices. Before I begin my introductions of the panel, can I just say this is a very emotive discussion we're about to have and one which I hope will be treated with sincerity and respectfulness. This event stems from the topic, personal is political. And as we will discuss some of the areas such as abortion to equal marriage, personal rights have required political action. Is assisted dying Scotland's next great social reform? As we draw upon personal and international experiences to legislation on the table here in Scotland, today we have an expert panel who will discuss the most deeply personal political issues of our time. So when the personal is political, we then have the politics of increasing personal choice. And assisted dying is an issue that transcends political norms. Poland has shown this is an issue that unites us rather than divides voters. And if we link to other social change issues such as abortion, how has choice been achieved historically? The politics of dying in the 21st century has seen 200 million citizens worldwide now have access to the assisted dying law for Scotland proposed by our very own Liam MacArthur, MSP. So what can we learn from that experience? So I'm going to leave it in. On that note, I am going to introduce you to our panel. But may I give a quick run through of how today's event will run. The panel members will each have about five minutes to speak, introduce themselves and discuss their reasons why they became involved in the session and how they feel the issue of end of life choices links to other social change movements. The audience will then have the opportunity to ask questions to the panel. And please can I remind all audience members to keep their questions short and succinct. I am mindful that some audience members may wish to share their harrowing personal stories. But this is not the focus of the session today. Please also note that after today's session, there will be a breakout area in the cafe bar for anyone wishing to continue on with the discussion and share their views and experiences. We will then have the closing remarks from the panel and then the meeting will close. Can I just add as well, today we have the pleasure of Alex Greenwich MP for Sydney. And if I give you a wee brief introduction of the experience that Alex actually brings today, he is an independent member for Sydney in the New South Wales Parliament in Australia. He introduced landmark reforms into the House, including the Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill, which recently became law and will offer end-of-life choice to people with terminal illness. Alex's forthcoming Equality Bill will remove LGBTIQA plus discrimination from New South Wales law. And Alex will join the panel online. So thank you, Alex, for joining us today. So I'm actually going to stop there and I'm going to introduce our first panel member, who is Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks, Colette. Hello, thank you all for coming out today. My name is Ruth Davidson. I used to be an MSP here. I was here for 10 years. Uh, up until May of last year at the election. Um, and, and I think that the personal can be intensely political. Uh, the most personal speech uh, I ever gave in my 10 years here was talking about equal marriage. And uh, it was also the most nerve wracking. I was up all night the night before. Uh, I was sick before I spoke about it, um, despite having been quite high profile when I was running to be the leader of my party, my sexuality. It's not something that talked about in public much before and um, 
the whole process of that bill and taking it forward was intensely political because it bisected lots of really hard themes about love and faith and rights and things that were intensely personal to people. Um, I'm here today because I'm one of those rare beasts who is a politician that's prepared to say that they've changed their mind. Um, one of the other things that came, uh, one of the other pieces of legislation that came to Holyrood while I was a member here was a private member's bill on assisted dying and I voted against it. And one of the things that happens when you leave a parliament is you have a think about and you, you kind of go back and think about all of the things that you got involved in, what you didn't do, the misses, the losses, the wins. And this was the one that felt like it really got away. And, it, and it, I, felt, I felt a bit cowardly at the time, and I've felt nothing but cowardly since. Uh, and the reason that I was able to vote against it was because it was quite badly drafted law at the time. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't very watertight. There were lots of issues with it. And I was able to strike down the text without fully engaging uh, in the substance of it, and again, a very, very difficult subject, talking about um, what it is to live, what it is to die, who has agency, where the state should come in, what rights we have over our own bodies. Um, and also added to that was my own Christian faith, the fact that my sister is an NHS doctor. All of that played into what I was thinking about at the time. But uh, like I say, I, I, was able, I was able to, in clear conscience, say no at that time because the actual law wasn't good enough. Um, but on the issue, uh, I have had a bit of a journey on this and, and everything that's happened in my life uh, in the seven years since that bill came here uh, has pointed me to the fact that this is something that I think needs to happen and is ready to happen. Um, and the intellectual arguments haven't changed. I mean, it is surely wrong that um, people who seek release are kept in pain. It's surely wrong that if you've got 10,000 pounds, you can go to Switzerland. Uh, if you don't, you can't. Um, I think that it's wrong that 300 terminally ill people a year uh, in the United Kingdom seek to take their own life uh, to end their own suffering. And I think it's wrong that in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, you can face up to 14 years in prison for helping somebody. Uh, and in this country, in Scotland, you can face a culpable homicide charge. Um, but for me, it was actually not the intellectual arguments. It was the personal arguments. Everything that has happened in my life since then um, IVF, the amount of choice that I had over choosing a donor, you could filter by eye colour, by blood group, all of this sort of thing, the agency you have over your own life. 50,000 people a year go through IVF in this country and you know the church has nothing to say about that but it has an awful lot to say uh, about end of life issues. Um, issues with people within my own family having life limiting conditions uh, and I, I know we don't want to talk in, in great detail um, about our own personal experiences. All of that has, uh, has played into where I think that we should be. Uh, and I think that it seems to me that there is an imbalance here. There is an imbalance that people who desperately wish to be released from pain, who want to be able to be in charge of their own pain management and of how and of where and of who is there and of how their pain is managed at the time of death, aren't allowed to do so. And there is an imbalance to me from people who are campaigned on this and have spoken uh, at events like this who say that it is wrong that it's people without terminal illness that are making the decisions over people who have it. Um, and I think if we look around the world, there's 200 million people that live in countries or states where this is legal and not one of them have chosen to rescind the law once they've introduced it. Uh, and I, I think that's quite telling. Uh, and I think in terms of conclusion to let us get into uh, where everyone else is, uh, and we can talk about protections and all the rest of it, um, I think the biggest imbalance is that those who desperately want this aren't trying to impose it on those people who don't, but that those people that don't want this are telling the people who desperately want to need it that they don't even have a choice. And that's, I think, where parliaments can step in and can change the law. So that's, that's my journey to getting here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. And I'm going to pass over to Kezia. Thanks, Colette, and good morning, folks. My name is Kez Dugdale. Um, I'm now the director of the John Smith Centre at the University of Glasgow, which exists to make the positive case for politics and public service. And it's through that vein of trying to promote civilised, healthy debate where we all learn to disagree better that I want to pay tribute to Liam, actually, because I can't think of a, a better MSP, a better placed MSP to do that work here in the Scottish Parliament of, of changing minds and, and driving such an important issue um, forward. Why am I here? 
Why blame Margot MacDonald, actually? <laughs> when I first got uh, elected in 2011, the Labour offices were on the ground floor of this building, and uh, Margot MacDonald's office was right at the very end, and she knew everything about everyone. You couldn't go to the loo without Margot MacDonald knowing that you were on your way. Uh, and as the years went by, actually, she relied, as many folk will know, on a mobility scooter to get to and from the vote. She used this as a weapon, or, or should I say a road blockade? Because what she would do is she would park the mobility scooter across the bottom of the, of the corridor and basically kettle you in. And there she had you captive. And it was actually through those conversations with Margot over the years uh, that I became a firm supporter um, of this particular issue and of progressing it through Parliament because Margot made such a compelling case. You've heard some of that al already from Ruth this morning. Too many people were dying undignified deaths and a great deal of pain. Their nearest and dearest were facing severe legal jeopardy. That was deeply unjust. And also the indignity of knowing you could access help and support if you had the money and if you didn't, you, you couldn't. Those were Margot's three arguments that were used so persuasively uh, over the years. I've got to tell you though, um, when it moved to the floor of the Parliament, like Ruth, I voted against it. Uh, and I don't have many, and that's after being a signatory to the bill actually, I was one of the 18 people that signed the bill when Margot put it forward. And since the theme of today is the personal being political, I want to tell you why and do so very honestly. So by the time it got to the floor of the Parliament, due to um, the length of the legislative process and the decline of the Labour Party's fortunes, uh, I was leader of the Labour Party um, by that point. Uh, surrounded by lots of advisers that wanted to tell me what the best thing for the party was and what the best thing um, for me to do was. And I was persuaded that the public were against this and perhaps more specifically that Labour voters um, were against this. That I would damage my party, uh, that I would create disunity within my party uh, if I were to vote for it whilst leader. And I was persuaded that that was just a bit of unnecessary pain. Now, you might think I should have been bigger and have more courage and more character to have overcome that at the time. You may well be right. Uh, and I regret that. But also, um, I went home uh, at night to a partner who told me then that if I voted for it, I might as well not come home again. And I mention that again today because these two factors of public opinion, what we perceive public opinion to be, and the deeply personal circumstances of how people's relationships function, what they've experienced themselves and how that relates to their politics, are the two barriers in the way of this particular issue now becoming law. And I think if we are in the business of changing people's minds, if we want to build consensus and majority and make sure that those that disagree with us can do so respectfully, without being othered, without being victimised, without having their concerns ignored, that's the way to building a piece of legislation which will pass the test of time and also advance the rights of people who really need this progress um, to be made. So thank you for that opportunity to share that experience with you and I look forward to the rest of the conversation this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Kezia. I'm now going to pass over to Liam. Thank you very much, uh, Colette, and uh, can I add a, a, a very warm welcome to all of you and um, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Liam MacArthur. I am um, the member in charge, the, the MSP that's looking to bring forward um, the latest bill to try and to amend the law in, in relation to assisted dying. I very much recognise Kezi's description of uh, Margot's kettling tactics. I seem to find myself kettled into Queensbury House Bar, which is now affectionately known as Margot's, uh, where I uh, <laughs> was treated to a, a discourse on uh, on the case for assisted dying. It, it, she was uh, pushing against an open door, unlike Kez and Ruth. Uh, I have uh, been a supporter of assisted dying throughout my time in Parliament since 2007. But I well remember um, sitting, uh, listening to a members debate. I think it was the first time I'd, I'd uh, gone into the, the chamber for a debate I wasn't due to participate in. <laughs> and listening to my former colleague, Jeremy Purvis, um, lead a debate. He was looking to bring forward a bill. This was before Margot had brought forward her bill but to bring forward a bill based on the Oregon uh, model. And it struck me that those such as Jeremy and those across the, the chamber making the argument for change were doing something pretty profound, but also doing something pretty brave. And I, I mean, I, I know Kez and Ruth have castigated themselves for um, what they refer to as cowardice, but it struck me on that occasion that this was a difficult issue, almost a third rail, that um, your political career would be damaged, possibly terminally so, if you were to uh, engage in the case for, 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 for change. 
Um, I think over the, over the years that, um, that, that debate has developed, but that debate, I think, uh, proved to me what this parliament should be about. Um, it, it didn't break down political lines. There were those from, from all parties arguing both sides of the argument and doing so passionately and without resorting to the usual kind of political uh, brickbats. I remember a more recent debate on Margot's bill that, that fell at, at um, well, it was taken up by Patrick Harvey by that stage after Margot's um, uh, untimely death, um, and making the case in support of a bill that was, as Ruth said, far from uh, perfect. It, it would have needed an awful lot of amending at stage two and stage three, but we never got the opportunity to test that um, proposition. I, I, I find that regrettable. Um, but I argued passionately in, in favour of it. My colleague Alison McInnes, um, sitting behind me in the chamber, argued passionately against it. And again, uh, it was one of those occasions where I felt enormously proud uh, of this parliament and, and what it was able to do in terms of uh, giving voice to a, a debate um, that is happening day and daily uh, across the country. I feel though now that um, the political mood has shifted. It is more in line with where the the public mood has been for some time now um, that there is a desire to see a change in the law and that is driven in large part by the sort of personal experiences that, um, that Ruth spoken to but are um, I think the, uh, the everyday experience of very, mem uh, very many MSP colleagues uh, across the chamber. And while the bill I'll, I'll look to introduce probably early next year um, will need amending. Um, there's very few, if any, bills that don't get amended over the course of their passage through Parliament. I detect um, a desire amongst more of my colleagues now to find reasons to vote for it, rather than, as Ruth was describing before, finding reasons to vote against it. There is a long way to go, but this is, I think, the next great, I'll call it liberal reform or social uh, reform. I think once we pass this law, um, we will wonder why on earth it's taking us so bloody long to do so. Um, but we need to get the detail of this right. I'm looking forward to hearing from, from Alex um, uh, very shortly because I think some of the experience that we're seeing internationally and particularly in some of the states in, in Australia is very pertinent um, for uh, the debate we're going to have uh, here in the, in the Scottish Parliament. So with that um, professional and seamless segue, uh, I, will, I will leave it there and look forward uh, to the question and answer session. And, and, and thanks. Thanks very much, Liam. And I know, having sat on CPG, that Liam's contribution has been really insightful. So thank you. Thank you. And um, on that, I will pass over to Alex. And we're really looking forward to your contributions today, Alex. So thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And good evening from Sydney. Uh, I'm coming to you from the East um, and we are on Gadigal land in Australia. We always acknowledge our First Nations people on whose land we meet. Um, and I'm really uh, pleased to be here to contribute and, and share our thoughts on the Australian experience. Um, uh, from the outset, let me just say you will achieve voluntary assisted dying uh, in Scotland. It is a reform that is critically important to your community. Uh, and a reform whose time has come. Um, a little bit of background on me. I'm the member for Sydney in metropolitan Sydney. I'm an independent. I, I led Australia's campaign for marriage equality. And in 2019, I also legislated to decriminalise abortion in New South Wales. Um, uh, just this year, uh, a few weeks or months ago, we legislated for voluntary assisted dying. Uh, that by far was the most emotive uh, and most personal reform I have been involved in. Um, it, you know, parliaments do not talk about death a lot. Uh, we like to talk about all the good news stories, uh, the announceables and things we've achieved. We don't like to talk about death. Um, and the reality is though, we all die. And some people uh, die well, some people die poorly. Um, and what we're talking about is legislation, which is for people who have a terminal illness, who are dying, and who want to have the choice uh, to be able to, to pick the time and circumstances in which, in which they die through a, a range of safeguards, which no doubt will be in place in the Scottish law. I think that the big learnings from the New South Wales experience in our parliament 
is is a conservative parliament. Um, the leaders of the Labor Party and the conservative coalition who governs both opposed my legislation, um, but both allowed a free vote or conscience vote on the legislation. Um, and I think, although it was an extremely personal and emotive story, supporters of the bill spoke about uh, family members or friends who they had seen uh, with the terminal illness die horrifically. Uh, opponents of the bill spoke about their own personal experiences and why they uh, opposed the legislation. Critical to the entire debate was a respect for everybody's views. Um, and the position which everybody comes to. And, and people came to this debate from a very personal uh, position, uh, from a faith-based position, uh, from a professional position. We have, you know, the, the deputy leader of the National Party, who is a coalition partner in our government, was a palliative care nurse, a strong supporter of the bill because of that experience. Um, and we had people who, you know, were, were strongly representing their constituents' views, which were always in support of the bill. And some who were actually really confused about the detail of the legislation and really needed time uh, to, to analyse it. Um, so what, what I really learned was respect and patience were critical to, to the legislation passing through our parliament. Um, one of the benefits uh, which uh, of the tension between the opponents and supporters of reform, and this has actually been seen in every single Australian jurisdiction that has legislated for voluntary assisted dying is we saw a unanimous support for an increase of funding and access to palliative care services. And as a result of the legislation passing up our parliament, the New South Wales government also invested a further 750 million Australian dollars in palliative care services. So between the, the, the increased funding and access to palliative care and what I feel is a, one of the, the strongest and most robust pieces of voluntary assisted dying legislation. New South Wales is, is now a, a really good place to die, um, whereas previously this was a topic our parliament didn't want to talk about. Um, obviously, the detail of the legislation is critical. Uh, we had had a similar experience with legislation which had gaps in it previously and was was voted down. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's it's almost good that that was voted down because we were able to then have a stronger piece of legislation that was introduced into, into this parliament. Um, I would say as the, as the debate goes along, it's gonna be really important to, to listen to and work with opponents and, and to, to not be adversarial, but to identify where common ground can be gained. We're very careful in the New South Wales legislative process not to put in place new barriers. So I'll give the example of um, a psychiatric assessment. In some cases, a referral to a psychiatrist is important, but not in all cases. So we ensured that there were guidelines which created pathways for an adopter felt was appropriate rather than mandating another level which would create an, an access barrier for others. And, and that was a common theme throughout our legislation, uh, really empowering the doctors, putting in place strong guidelines um, and, uh, and having the, the, the person at the heart of the reform. Um, the personal stories which members heard were obviously very harrowing um, and, and a critical advocate for us were healthcare workers. People, um, you know, particularly emergency services people, so ambulance officers and the police. The, the police union and the nurses union and the emergency services union all backed our legislation. You know, too often uh, police would arrive at, at the home of a person with a terminal illness who had um, who had suicided in a very gruesome way. Our coroner um, was able to release data that showed 25% of suicides of people over the age of 40 are linked to a terminal diagnosis. Surely we can do better than that. And, and, and what, I would, what I said to opponents at the time is, what we need to facilitate is a conversation between people with a terminal illness and their doctor about their end of life choices, of which one should be voluntary assisted dying. So they feel they have that control and that option. But in the vast majority of cases, 
will will result in the person being referred to appropriate palliative care or other treatment services. Um, this is voluntary assisted dying. Uh, it is an option for people. Uh, it is an option which prevents someone with, as we know, say, you know, advanced bowel cancer from dying from choking on their own feces, or someone with advanced lung cancer from from dying from, you know, drowning in their own fluids. We know that's how these advanced terminal illnesses end, uh, and it's critical that we give people a, a, an option, a, a safe option, an option about so, of where they can control. Uh, to make sure that they can go in peace and dignity uh, and with their loved ones around. It was what I would say, whether you support this reform or are opposed to this reform, um, uh, members across uh, across opinions on this have said this was one of the most important debates for our parliament. It was one of the most honest debates that our parliament has had. Uh, and as I said, the legislation passed with, with a strong margin, but we all were able to celebrate as a result a strong investment in palliative care and, and an honest conversation about death, which is something that will happen to all of us. Thank you very much. Alex, I wonder if you could possibly give advice um, to our parliamentarians and activists here in Scotland who hope to see um, similar legislation as Liam touched upon. Well, well, look, I, I think I, I probably outlined a, a lot of that in, in my opening remarks. I think respect um, for opposing views and patience with undecided members of, of your parliament is critically important. Um, I, I think uh, research and, and statistics is critical. Um, and I think the role of healthcare workers is really, is really important to share what they see at the front lines. Um, I, you know, you, you will benefit, as we did in New South Wales, from plenty of legislative models around the world, which get increasingly in, increasingly sophisticated. Um, we have in, New South, in Australia, voluntary assisted dying in place since 2017, in Victoria, and now every state has it in place. Slightly different models, but, but largely the principles are the same. Uh, so we know this is safe. Um, we know this is an option that people want. And we also know that this is an option that not a lot of people take or can access because of the safeguards in legislation. And that is sort of, uh, we, we, we need to not get into this ideological uh, debate about the, um, which can, we can go down this path around the, the sanctity of life. This legislation is about people who are dying and they, and they want to be able to die well and in a peaceful way and have some control over that. Another really interesting um, a piece of research uh, has come out of Victoria who have done the, the, the state to our south, who have already done such true reviews of their legislation. Uh, and, and it is really interesting to know that people go through this process to the point in which the substance is prescribed to them and they don't take it. They just want to have the option it gives them that sense of control and that sense of peace that if things are getting bad, they do have a safe pathway which they have control of. Um, so this this is a this is a reform about options. It's a reform about control, uh, and, and you know it's a reform about really doing the the best thing in the interests of a, an individual who has a terminal illness. Okay, thanks very much. That's been a fantastic contribution, Alex, and thanks for attending today. Um, really appreciate it. So <clears throat> now I'm going to pass over to our audience, and if you could put your hand up and, and, and state your name as well. And if, again, can I just remind you all to keep your, your questions as short and succinct as possible, and for the, the panel members as well. The lady at the back there. If, could you stand up, please? Thank you very much. My name is Moira Forrest. I'm of a generation that remembers unofficial assisted dying. And in my lifetime, the passage to death has become, in my opinion, less humane. So I was particularly interested in 
hearing what healthcare workers, those counselling people facing death, and perhaps vets have to say on the issue. Thanks very much, Moira. Um, I'm going to pass over to Ruth, and um, Ruth's going to respond to that question. Hi, Moira. Thank you very much for your question. I, I think you're right. There's been not just a, a change in medicine uh, and um, the way in which we can help people, but there's also been a change within the medical profession. So um, the Royal College of Nurses have been in support of this for, for many years, but there has traditionally been or previously been opposition uh, from the Royal College of Physicians, from the doctors and from uh, the BMA, um, both of whom have dropped their official opposition to assisted dying in the last two to three years. So we've seen a big move in the medical profession. Um, the BMA held out for quite a long time. Their leadership had, had thought that this was quite important. They polled their members uh, and um, I think were probably quite shocked when they saw the change. Um, I think for balance, I, I should point out that the Royal College of Surgeons still hold the position that they are officially against this, but in terms of the people who are actually in charge of caring for those at the end of their life, the nurses uh, and the, the, the medics rather than the surgeons, um, the nurses have been in support for quite a long period of time uh, and any uh, official opposition from doctors' groups has now been dropped. That's a big change. Thanks. Thanks, Ruth. Um, Liam, do you want to yeah, touch upon I, that? I, just a, a couple of points following up. I mean, Ruth uh, made uh, probably the most substantive point in, in, in relation to where some of the professional representative bodies uh, stand. The, the, the consultation responses, the, the consultation itself that I uh, ran uh, last year um, and which elicited the, the, the biggest ever response we've seen to uh, proposals for a member's bill since the parliament was established, many of those came from those uh, from just those uh, professions uh, with uh, with their own uh, experience and, and I think one of the telling differences between previous consultations and and this consultation is how much people have been um, desperate to share either their personal or their professional or a combination of both experiences and I think that's informed the debate in a way uh, that we haven't uh, seen before. But I think picking up one of the points that, that, that Alex made as well and I think it was implicit Moira in your question <laughs> is about the data gathering. It's not perhaps the, the most obvious or sexiest end or most debated end of, of, of this debate, but it's absolutely crucial. I think some of the, 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 the data that we have on what's happening at the moment, uh, whether it's in terms of um, the, uh, the, the, the suicide statistics that we see and what's driving that, particularly for those with a terminal illness, whether it's in areas of palliative sedation, that's the withdrawal of, 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 uh, of, of treatment or withdrawal of um, food and, and, and liquids. All of that we need to capture far, far better, I think, than we do already, as well as capturing the data uh, behind the use of um, uh, uh, assisted dying should we get a change in the law here. I think, again, Alex made the point that very many people who um, opt to go down the route of a, a, an assisted death um, don't end up triggering it. Um, in a sense, it provides a reassurance. It's an insurance policy that if things get too bad, that option is available. But palliative care, which we're lucky in this country, is extremely good. I think there's an argument for investing more in broadening the access to it. And I, I would hope that this uh, debate around um, my proposals will allow that sort of debate to happen and maybe the, uh, a similar outcome to what we've seen in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think that data gathering piece is what particularly those in, in, in the professions that you've referred to will be very keen to see. And I think in terms of the wider public interest, we absolutely uh, need to see because at the moment there are far too many grey areas. OK, thanks very much. There's a lady at the back. Um, yes, hi. Hi there, good morning. Um, my name's Gillian Wright and I'm a previously a palliative care doctor, but now work in medical ethics. Um, and then just on point of clarity, I, I just wanted to say that the vast majority of palliative care doctors in Scotland are opposed to assisted suicide and euthanasia because they're extremely concerned, particularly for, for vulnerable patients and the fact that people might be influenced by the fact that this was made um, state-assisted dying, for example. Um, and I think just for a point of um, concern, if you look at data from Oregon, 
more, more than half of patients in Oregon do cite that feeling a burden um, is one of the reasons that they opt for assisted suicide, not just for pain, but actually for feeling a burden. And I think uh, particularly healthcare workers are concerned that that's not the kind of society we want to build. Um, and also particularly in Oregon that suicide rates, general suicide rates have gone up. Um, so there's great concern in the medical profession. And just on, on Ruth's point about the BMA, um, it was actually those doctors who look after dying patients, so oncologists, general practitioners, um, palliative care doctors, general physicians, who were most opposed. And it was those who, who don't actually look after dying patients, so ENT doctors, for example, they were the ones who were in favour. So yeah, it sorry, does bear looking you, after the data. Can I just data. ask you to kind of yeah. sum up what your actual question is to the panel? Well, one of my questions was, I was just intrigued by the, the, the fact that you're keen to engage with concerns, but yet the, there's nobody on the panel who is opposed. Uh, thanks, uh, Gillian. Um, I mean, for point of reference, you are from, um, from Care Not Killing, our, our, um, our duty of care. Um, I, I think I'm very um, prepared to engage um, with your own organisation and, and, and with opponents of a change in the law. I think, though, as I said um, in my introduction, this is, a, this is a, a, a change that now needs to happen. I think the debate needs to be around how it happens, what are the safeguards that provide at least some reassurance, whether it's to those um, in, the, uh, in, in the health professions, whether it's to the, the wider public. Um, but ultimately, this is a change that um, we need to see uh, happen, and therefore that's where the, 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 uh, the, the focus of those uh, discussions uh, needs to take place. I think in relation to um, those within the palliative care um, sector, I, I think what's interesting in terms of the consultation responses, and I need to be slightly careful, I'm due to uh, publish the uh, report on the consultation responses uh, early next uh, month, but as I said before, there were many, many responses from those uh, from the healthcare uh, professions. Many of them, though, chose to do so anonymously. And I, and I dare say one of the underlying factors there is that there is a, a pressure within the sectors not to um, stick the, the, the head above the prior, but particularly uh, in, 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 in areas like palliative care, uh, where this might be seen um, for whatever reason as, as, a, as a conflict. Uh, with their responsibilities. I think as we've seen across the world, this has been introduced in, in ways that are safe, that do command public support, do command the support of the, the healthcare professions, and we're not seeing uh, a groundswell in any of those states or countries uh, to see the, uh, the legislation uh, overturned. So I, I can understand there are anxieties out there. We need to get the detail of this right, and I'm very happy to continue to engage, but it'll be an engagement on how we get this right rather than whether or not uh, we need a change in the law. Can I just quickly as well touch upon um, what Gillian said in terms of being a burden? I, I, I actually see it as um, helping the family uh, as well um, and, and not so much as that vulnerability you touched upon. However, that burden um, and, and, and the way in which people, um, basically the experience they've got and the trauma from seeing an undignified death um, um, so again with the correct palliative care in place and also just that reassurance of choices as well um, that it actually aids in, in, in the family and friends around them and it's been evidenced time and time again about families who have suffered PTSD due to, due to the lack of proper care and whatnot as well so I, I will just leave it at that and I'm going to ask Ruth um, to, I think she wants to make a comment. Yeah, yeah. so um, my maiden speech in the, in the House of Lords when I joined last year was actually on this issue because there was a private member's bill that was brought forward there. And, and what was, I, I, I think, most heartening about it was that on both sides, um, there was the concession that everybody is arguing from the point of what they believe to be the best for people at the worst time in their life. Uh, and that we absolutely accept that people are coming to this in, in good faith. Uh, and in terms of the, the, the point that was just raised, I'd, I'd just like to clarify the BMA survey, which I was talking about, had uh, results from 28,986 people. And the breakdown of which of their members worked in oncology or elsewhere 
wasn't made. So while it, I'm absolutely willing to concede that it may be true that palliative care doctors or um, people from uh, oncology or general practitioners may have, I, I don't actually think in good faith we can say that that was the result of that poll because that breakdown was never published because there was nearly 29,000 people that responded to it. Okay, thanks, Ruth. Um, can I just take the lady at the front in, in the green top? This is a question, perhaps, Chairman, if I may, through to um, Liam. To what extent, if any, were the Court of Guardianship involved in the consultation? And um, will there be, what is your, how do you gauge the likelihood or not of getting consensus on an interfaith basis? Because if you would take the doctrinal view of somebody like Professor Haldane, it might well differ to that of other faiths. And there's no ethicist or philosopher on the panel this morning. And I wondered, in respect of what Ruth said earlier, um, if any of the consultation responses were framed in such a way as to indicate that part of the medical fears might have been about subsequent litigation. Okay, thank you. That's quite a few questions, so okay. hopefully Liam I'll, can wrap that up I'll, quickly. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I think in terms of powers of attorney, I, I suppose that gets us into the territory of um, advanced directions or, or, or living wills. I, I don't think this bill is going to be able to address that in the way that I know some would, would wish it to, to do. Um, I, I think there are, there are problems there, but I, I, I would imagine even if it's not contained within the bill I introduced to, to Parliament, it will very much be an issue that will be raised in evidence to the, I'm assuming the Health Committee, who will be the lead committee in the Parliament, who will want to take evidence on the, uh, on, on, uh, or take oral evidence on the submissions that are made to it. So it will be Health an... Health or human rights? I suspect Health Committee will, will take the lead, but other committees with an interest have an opportunity to, to, to be secondary committees and take evidence on, on specific aspects of it, and it may well be that that is picked up by, uh, by another committee. But it, 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 I'm not intending um, to, uh, to, to, to include that in the proposals I bring forward. In terms of those of faith, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, I, I don't want to, to, to rest too heavily on polling, um, understand the, uh, the, the, the limitations of that or the, or, or the potential pitfalls, but nevertheless, I think, um, there are those of pretty much every faith who both support and oppose a change in the law here, and, and there will be probably every grade in, in between. I recognise that um, uh, uh, church groups and, and, and faith groups may take um, a position on behalf of, of their faith or their church, but I would contend that that isn't necessarily a position held by everybody in that church or of that faith. And we're seeing that in the consultation. We see it in, in, in polling um, as well. So I, I think there's a health warning I would attach uh, to the positions that are, uh, that are held there. Um, and the final question was on... Whether, from what Ruth has said... Oh, protection for... Yeah, yeah. Well, in a sense... Yeah, no, and, and that will that will absolutely need to form part of the law. And I think by 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 encapsulating that within the law, it provides that legal certainty. So you're absolutely right. I think there will be anxieties there. Some that Gillian was referring to before may arise as a result um, of perhaps fears um, of, of 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 litigation. Uh, but the, the the intention of the bill will be to provide that that legal certainty and that legal protection. I, I, and and at the same time we need to find ways um, of allowing those who have conscientious objection to this an ability to opt out uh, of participating, even, even if they then there's still a requirement to signpost, as there is, for example, um, with, uh, with abortion. But I think recognising that this is a choice uh, and that there are those um, for whom um, th this, is, this does not square with their conscience and we will wish to, to opt out of, of participating, we need to find mechanisms for allowing them to do that. Okay, thanks Liam. I, I'm obviously conscious of the time because somebody actually reminds me of the time. Um, right, okay, so like 10 minutes or so. So um, there's a gentleman over here with his hands up. Um, oh, maybe it was yourself, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. 
Um, my name's Gordon Wiley, and I am currently the treasurer and former convener of an organization called Friends at the End, which has a great interest in all of this. And my, my question is probably addressed more to Baroness Ruth than anyone else, since she's now a member of the United Kingdom legislature. The General Medical Council has jurisdiction over all the medical practitioners in the entire United Kingdom. And it does not take account of the fact that our law is different from the law of England and Wales in particular. And Ruth, I think it was, drew attention earlier to the fact that the law there is different and that people can be sent to prison for, I think it's up to 14 years, if they help somebody in any kind of way, uh, even to discuss end-of-life choices. And the General Medical uh, Council has issued a fiat to the fact, uh, to effect, uh, that you cannot discuss end-of-life choices with your uh, patients, nor can you issue them with certificates that will help them to go to Switzerland. So I do feel that the General Medical Council needs to be brought into line with the fact that we live in a different jurisdiction here, and I wonder if something can be done about that. Thank you. Um, I mean, actually, uh, while I'm happy to take this one, I'm, I'm sure Kez and, and uh, Liam will, will um, want to weigh in too. Um, when devolution happened, there were lots of pan-UK bodies that didn't have within them a kind of understanding of what that meant or where changes happened. And, and it's not just for Scotland, but for Northern Ireland and for, for Wales as well. As change arises, they have to adapt and change too to be able to comply within the laws of the land. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think it, it's perhaps a, a bit patrician to say get the GMC into line, but I do think that um, as laws change and as that directly affects their members, you will be able to see that reflected in the way in which pan European bodies like the GMC uh, are, are also able to um, uh, work within the, the laws of, of each of the, the four home nations. Is that fair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, thanks. Uh, <laughs> um, it's probably get time for one or two more questions. Sorry. Um, there's a gentleman at the back there. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Gareth Morgan. I wanted to pick up on some of the uh, faith based points that have been made, which I think have been really actually helpful. Um, thank you, in particular, to Ruth, to making reference to the fact that it's your own Christian faith that partly you to support this. And also to follow up on what Liam was said, I would really say to all the MSPs who are supporting this legislation, please don't treat the faith groups as somehow being, quotes on the other side, because as you rightly say, there is a huge perspective within that. Um, I'm, I speak myself as a practicing Catholic who's actually very keen to see change the law on, the, on these lines. And although the official Catholic teaching just seems to be completely opposed, when you start delving into Catholic teaching, there's all sorts of cases where things may not be seen as desirable, but they're not necessarily morally culpable. And you get into complicated situations like that. I've certainly found talking to Catholic parishioners after mass that uh, people are quite sensitive and supportive of the idea that someone in great pain should be allowed um, to have their, their life ended. People sometimes don't quite understand the need for legislation. A lot of people say, oh, you should just leave it to the doctors. But of course, they don't understand that you've got to change the legislation in order to allow doctors to do that. And so I just wanted to make the appeal. Um, please, as you go forward, can you work on this basis of dialogue with faith groups and recognize there is a lot of common ground to build on. And particularly, I think um, there's real scope for bringing um, the faith communities in on the final processes. We know that in Holland, for example, there's a lot of close working between palliative care, um, faith chaplains, and assisted dying. And that holistic linking people together at end of life with the spiritual care and the uh, physical care um, is so important. And if that could be focused on the bill, that'd be great. Okay, thanks very much for your comments. Um, can I, what I'm going to do is I'm actually, there was a lady at the front there with her hands up, so I think I'm going to take the two, the comments that you made and the lady there, and then I'll ask the panel to comment or, or whoever wants to comment on it, and then we're going to get to closing remarks um, by each of the panel members. So, your lady, yep, thank you. Hello, my name is Kirsten Nielsen, um, and it's, there's two things. I did some living care work, um, and I live on my own, abroad from where my family lives. <clears throat> this is my nation, and they are still back in Denmark. <laughs> so I, I have two issues, and I'm wondering if, if they are gonna tag on to this end of life. Um, I would like to, res to keep the right to not be a bother. 
that's part of my dignity, that if I get to a stage where I could be kept from dying, as opposed to kept alive, it's a very fine line. But there's a place in there where I preserve the right to not be a bother, is one thing. The other thing is, does mm, the DNRs tie in with this at all? Because in my care work, I looked after quite a few who had had s surgeries to survive, which have left them in a situation that was frustrating to them, so frustrating that they came up against the world and had horrible, bitter lives, drinking lives, um, lives of, um, you know, tired of the wars were phrases that came out. So I'm wondering if um, it could be okay to not be want to be a bother and if the DNRs could maybe also help end of life with dignity. Okay, thank you very much. Um, would any of the panel members like to comment on? on? I'll make a couple of very brief uh, comments. In, in relation to um, the, the gentleman's point about um, those of faith, um, I, I think, as I say, it's, it's reflected in what we're seeing in polling, it's reflected in what we're seeing in terms of the responses to the, to the consultation. I've certainly tried to offer those reassurances to uh, my MSP colleagues. Um, it's far more influential when uh, those of faith who are supportive um, of, uh, of a change in the law contact those MSPs uh, directly. Um, but uh, I, I think that, that, that position, that uh, understanding is far clearer now than it was, as I say, when I sat in the members' debate that Jeremy Purvis led, um, those voices um, of, of opposition were very strong, they were very um, uh, vocal, they were very um, influential, and it did feel like a dangerous place to be in advocating for change. We're no longer there, and I think part of that is because people understand um, that within the faith community there is a breadth of views as there is in the population as a whole. In terms of the, 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 the right to, to not be a bother, I think back to the point, again, that Gillian um, <coughs> referred to about um, uh, the situation in Oregon and people um, citing the fact that they, did, that they felt a burden. It, that's right, it was a closed list of options to tick. Um, being a burden, though, um, was not amongst the, 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 the top three. It was, the, it was the, the, the loss of autonomy, the loss of a quality of life. It, it, those were the drivers behind the decision to seek an assisted death. The not wanting to be a bother, the not wanting to be a burden, um, fed into that, but was of a lower order uh, of priority. And actually, one of the concerns about vulnerable people being encouraged to shuffle off this mortal coil by um, nefarious members of the family who are eager to, 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 to grab onto their inheritance ahead of time. Actually, the experience in other countries has been that the resistance to the assisted death has often come from the family and actually getting the wishes of the person that wants to die um, uh, uh, respected has been um, difficult. Those conversations about what we do at the end of life, how, how we want to die um, uh, and not just how we, we want to live uh, is, I think, a very healthy thing for us as a society um, to, to, to engage in. And as I say, coming out of the pandemic, um, we've probably had more occasion to reflect on those sorts of issues than we, than, than we had previously. I'm not sure how the bill will touch on, on, on DNRs. I, I'll be interested to see what comes through in terms of the, uh, the, the evidence to the committee and I'm fairly sure it will, it will feature as part of that, that debate. Okay, thanks, Liam. So that, 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 that um, brings us to the end um, of our, our discussion on this. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of the panel members to make a very brief closing remark on this, uh, and that will bring us to a close. So can I start with Kezia and ask for you, for you to kind of close up for us, Kezia? Thanks, Colette. And I just really wanted to make one uh, further point, um, which is really about the reference we've made today to Liam's bill and the consultation around Liam's bill. It'd be very easy, I think, after this past hour to think that was the be-all and the end-all of it, and that there, that was the end of you being asked your opinions on this or your ability to influence it. By the point it's introduced to Parliament, there will be a really extensive consultation process that will go through through the Parliament's three stages. So the Parliament will sit in a full plenary session where the principles of the bill will be discussed. And I think at that point, for the first time, we might see a majority of our MSP colleagues support the principle of what we're talking about today. That doesn't mean it becomes law at that point. It goes into a very detailed and considered committee stage where line by line issues are addressed, expert witnesses are brought in, 
there's the opportunity for citizens of the country to influence that as well. So to address the point that the man at the front made earlier around the legal provisions and, and how that might be addressed, that's the point where you find little knots that need untied, like perhaps what the role of the Lord Advocate might be in providing additional assurance around any prosecution uh, aspects of what may or may not happen in the event of the law becoming uh, an act of parliament. And then it goes into the final stage three part of the parliamentary process where all the MSPs come back together to look at that piece of legislation in the round. Does it do everything we want it to do? There's a further opportunity there for people to amend it from the floor of the chamber. So I just wanted to reassure people that, that, that there is a long and considered process here as there is for all pieces of legislation that go through the parliament and the chance to examine the detail and to go through this and try and bring as many people as possible with us uh, along that common goal is there for everyone to grasp. Thanks, Kezia. Beth, can I ask you to close up? Uh, on the wider issue, the, the thing that I find most heartening about today's discussion was listening to uh, Alex in, in New South Wales and um, him explaining that having had such a, a process to consider this and to have that serious and often difficult debate, one of the things that came out of it was that as well as introducing um, voluntary assisted dying, there was also an uplift uh, in funding for palliative care because palliative care had come under the microscope. And a lot of people, I think, worry that if we introduce this, that means that we take money and focus away and it doesn't have to be this way. And we're lucky in this country. Uh, my wife um, is Irish. She lost her mum to cancer when she was 14. She'd been diagnosed several years um, before uh, she died. And she distinctly remembers her mum and dad going around the house working out what to sell to fund some of her care. So we're really lucky, but don't think that doesn't mean that you can't also demand better for people at their end of life, whether they are given the opportunity to choose this or not, because we can and should demand better for our palliative care, as well as offer people the opportunity to be able to have more agency about how they die, where they die, the sort of pain relief they have when they die, who's with them, uh, and what sort of medical care and support that they can have at the time of their death. Thanks, Chris. Very quickly, Liam, can you close <laughs> <Very quick. laughs> or sum up? Uh, not a great deal to add. I've probably had more in my allocation of time. I think the point that, that, that Ruth made in, in relation to, to palliative care and, and um, the fact that this isn't a zero-sum game, in fact, quite the contrary. This is an opportunity to look at what we do in terms of palliative care and the range of end-of-life choices we have. I think good quality palliative care, we don't always have the access uh, that we should have, particularly to specialist palliative care. I think it's an opportunity through this bill uh, to drive forward that debate. Uh, but there is plenty of opportunity to engage uh, in, this, in this discussion. As Ruth said, as Kezia said, uh, the hard yards are still to come mm. in getting the detail of this right. But I think if we can do so in a respectful fashion, and I, I appreciate there will be those disappointed because they don't want to see a change in the law at all, and those who are disappointed because they don't believe um, that this goes uh, far enough. But nevertheless, I think if we can conduct it in a respectful manner, we will come out uh, with uh, legislation that this parliament um, can be proud of and that this country uh, and our population uh, can have confidence in. And that, I think, must be what we aspire to. Thanks very much, Liam. That brings us to the end of this event and it's been so insightful and really, really interesting and there's been so many good contributions today and there's been lots of uptake from the audience as well. So can I just say thanks to our panel and Alex is no longer here with us but his uh, contribution today was absolutely fantastic. So thank you once again and I'm being told quickly to wind up because we're running out of time. So thanks very much for coming along today and listening to us. It's the first one of our Festival of Politics and there's been an outstanding attendance as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.